Welcome all to another Monday Space News Roundup with me, where we'll discuss the absolutely insane developments with SpaceX's Starship program, as well as all the interesting developments from ESA, NASA, China, and the International Space Station. We've actually got a huge amount of stuff to cover in today's video, so let's move right on to the first segment of the coverage, everything Starship from last week. I mean, where to begin, really? Now that Booster 3 has served its purpose as a cryo, pressure, and static fire test vehicle, all attention last week turned to completing Booster 4. The week began with the installation of all four grid fins to the giant booster, and all 29 Raptor engines were fitted in less than 24 hours overnight on Monday the 2nd of August. That is insane, but not wanting to kill pace, the very next day the colossal booster was rolled out of the high bay and was then moved to the launch site where it was then mounted to the orbital launch mount one day later. Seems a little bit cute when you think of how Elon described the week before last week's pace as Warp 9. I would say that this week they've definitely reached Warp 10, but I don't want to jinx it because the last time anyone achieved Warp 10, uh, Tom Paris became a salamander. So let's just say they've definitely hit Warp 9.2. <laughs> anyway, got a bit off topic there. What you might notice about the rollout of Booster 4 that you may think looks a little bit odd is the way the grid fins are all extended. We're used to seeing the Falcon 9's grid fins being folded up against the booster until deployment to reduce the drag on ascent, whereas we now know that this isn't the case with Super Heavy, or at least this early prototype. Instead, this booster's fins can only rotate, they can't fold in. There could be a number of reasons for this. For starters, it could simply be to keep things simple, since Booster 4 is just a prototype, or engineers may have decided that the aerodynamic profile of an extended fin isn't too different from a folded fin, or perhaps maybe the extra weight that a hinge system would add would negate any aerodynamic efficiency gains, or perhaps the massive weight of the booster would be too much for a folding grid fin to support without buckling, considering the long-term goal with these boosters is to catch them using the orbital launch tower. Eric recently posted this great render of what this might eventually look like. Of course, the plan with Booster 4, and indeed Ship 20, will be a soft splashdown in the ocean, but SpaceX do eventually want to catch the booster in a way that looks fairly similar to what you can see on screen, and we know that this is fairly accurate because we had confirmation of that from Elon Musk himself. Of course, Booster 4 is only one half of the dynamic duo that SpaceX will be using to perform the very important mission of sending a wheel of cheese to low Earth orbit. That's not a joke, by the way. Ship 20 will be the vehicle that sits on top of the massive first stage that will complete the voyage into space. A thermal protection tile, or just TPS, covered Starship segment was rolled out of the mid-bay, and we got our first proper glimpses of the silver and black beast. Not long after, Elon Musk tweeted this photograph showing all six Raptor engines attached to the aft section of the vehicle. The central three are the sea level engines that we've all come to know and love from the flights of Starhopper, SN5, 6, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 15, albeit seeing incremental improvements along the way, but we've never seen a Starship with the massive outer three engines. These are actually effectively just the same as the engines in the center, but with much larger engine bells. The reason for the much bigger bells is because these are optimized to work best in the vacuum of space. An engine works best when the pressure of its exhaust gases is about the same as the pressure outside the engine bell. Since the vacuum of space has a pressure of zero, <laughs> vacuum optimized engines are simply made to be as big as feasibly possible. Sea level engines are smaller since they work in the higher ambient pressure of the lower atmosphere and as such want their exhaust gases to be at a higher pressure than their vacuum counterparts. Hence, the stark visual difference between the Vacuum Raptor and the Sea Level Raptor, despite them being virtually identical in terms of their actual design. This is, of course, a very oversimplified explanation of what is a rather complicated physics topic, but that's a quick crash course on why these two engine types look so different. Anyway, getting a little bit off track here. Ship 20 was then swiftly moved into the high bay for nose cone stacking. The nose cone itself saw many TPS tiles fitted in the low bay last week, as well as both of its forward flaps. Once all that was together, it was then wheeled across to the high bay, and it was lifted and mated onto the lower section overnight on the 4th of August. Not long after this, the vehicle was rolled down the road to the launch site, where it was then mounted to Booster 4 after a brief delay due to high winds. And there it is, in Elon's words, a dream come true. The Saturn V and N1 rockets have been dethroned as the tallest and most powerful rockets ever built with the stacking of the gargantuan Starship full vehicle. 
This, however, was only a fit test, and as a result, Ship 20 was subsequently lifted off the stack and back down to ground level and returned to the high bay. But, folks, this is a clear indication that we are looking at this month, potentially, where we'll see the vehicle restacked and then launched. 3D Daniel produced this excellent render of what this spectacular moment will look like. However, many things will need to happen before then, so it won't be any time this week. According to Elon, the four most significant items on the to-do list are to finish adding the remaining TPS tiles to Ship 20, install thermal protection for the booster engines, complete the ground propellant tanks, and finish the quick disconnect arm for the ship. One thing I do wonder about is what will happen to Booster 3. It's currently sitting there without any engines and is presumably destined for the scrap heap, but me personally, I think it would be awesome to see it wheels to the entrance of Starbase, where Ship 15 and 16 currently sit, and use it with either Ship 15 or 16 to construct a full-scale Starship monument at the entrance of the base, much like the Saturn V in Huntsville, Alabama, or maybe use them in a Kennedy Space Center-style exhibit with the booster and Starship up on a truss for visitors to walk underneath. What are your thoughts on this? I would love to hear if you agree with my idea or have any of your own. And hey, while you're down there, make sure you've hit the like button and subscribe button. It really helps to support the channel and subscribing will notify you of these videos the moment they go live, which is the best time to watch them considering that they're news videos. And let's face it, at the rate SpaceX are working, they're often outdated within the first couple of days. I make these videos every single Monday and of course build crazy rockets in Kerbal Space Program every single Saturday. And we always welcome new crew members aboard. Anyway, I'm going to wrap up my Starship coverage there and take a look at what else we saw in the space industry last week. We'll kick this segment off with the launches we saw last week. There were three and all were from China. The first took place on the 3rd of August and was a Hyperbola 1 rocket which was planned to place a Jilin-1 Earth observation satellite into low Earth orbit. I say planned to because unfortunately this launch was a failure. The rocket failed to achieve correct orbital insertion following a malfunction in fairing separation. This must be a real blow to the rocket's builder iSpace since this is now the second failure in a row for the Hyperbola 1 launcher meaning that out of its three flights, this rocket has only worked once. Unfortunately, all footage of the launch failure was removed from Chinese social media, and I don't want a chance re-hosting it and getting a strike on my channel, so the footage you're watching is the successful Hyperbola 1 launch from 2019. The next launch we saw was on the 4th of August and was a long March 6 that carried two communication satellites to polar low Earth orbit on behalf of German startup KLEO Connect. It's certainly novel to see a Chinese launch carrying a foreign payload and I'm happy to say that this mission was a success and both satellites are now operational in orbit. The third and final launch from last week was another long march, this time a long march 3BE, which placed a single Chinasat 2E satellite into geosynchronous Earth orbit. This will be used for military communications. Now to quickly cover launches that we didn't see last week. In last week's Space News video, I told you all that we'd see ULA launch Boeing's Starliner capsule to the International Space Station. Well, unfortunately, this did not go ahead. The rocket was rolled out to the pad and all seemed to be good to go, but then the spacecraft was rolled back to the vertical integration facility due to unexpected valve position indications in the Starliner propulsion system. Investigations are still ongoing, but as of right now, it's not clear when we'll see another launch attempt. Could be weeks, or if the problem is extensive, potentially months. Fingers crossed that the engineers can get the issue resolved sooner rather than later. In a final fun bit of space news, last week the International Space Station crew held their own Olympic Games, Team Soyuz vs Team Dragon. My favourite game was No Handball, where the crew need to get a ping pong ball through their respective hatch seal without touching it and only using their breath. <laughs> Other magnificent feats of athleticism included synchronised floating and gymnastics. Anyway, that's all the major events that I wanted to discuss from last week, but there's a ton of stuff to look forward to this week. Let's talk about that. I'm going to start this bit of the video with some deep space activities that we can expect to see this week. Today, and on the 11th of August, we'll see two Venus flybys from ESA missions. The first will be by the Solar Orbiter, which is a Sun observation satellite designed to perform detailed analysis of the inner heliosphere and solar wind, and perform close observations of the Sun's polar regions, something that's not very easy to do from Earth. The second Venus flyby of the week will be from the Bepi-Colombo probe, which is a joint venture between 
between ESA and JAXA. It's a Mercury mission that will perform a thorough investigation of Mercury, including analysis of its magnetic field, magnetosphere, and its interior and surface structures. Mercury is very hard to get to, and this mission is particularly difficult as this probe is not only set to encounter Mercury, but will also be entering orbit around it. This necessitates a lot of gravity assists. So far, it's performed a flyby of Earth and one Venus flyby, both taking place last year in 2020, but it's still got this week's Venus flyby to perform, as well as a further six flybys of Mercury itself before finally being able to enter orbit around Mercury on the 5th of December 2025. The third deep space activity we'll see this week is the ninth perihelion of the Parker Solar Probe. This is a NASA probe that launched in 2018, which is designed to make observations of the Sun's outer corona. This perihelion will see the probe come within 11.1 gigameters of the Sun, although it'll need to make several more flybys of Venus, three more to be exact, for it to lower its perihelion to the 6.9 gigameters that NASA are aiming for. We're also expecting to see some launches this week. The first will be on the 10th of August, and this will be the latest Cygnus resupply mission to the International Space Station, which as usual will be launched from an Antares 230 plus rocket from the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport. The Cygnus cargo spacecraft will be carrying about a thousand kilograms of new science experiments, including a muscle study and a 3D printing investigation. And for any Americans watching, converted to Freedom Unit, a thousand kilograms is about the same as 337 Armour Light AR-15 lightweight magazine-fed gas-operated semi-automatic rifles. We cater to all audiences here at Space This Week. <laughs> Moving on to the 12th of August, yes mateys, the public domain cat footage is back because India are launching another rocket and due to their government's litigious nature when it comes to YouTubers using footage of their launches, this is what you get instead. Anyway, this will be a GSLV Mark II launch vehicle, which stands for Geosynchronous Satellite Launch Vehicle, which will be launching a single Earth observation satellite into, as the rocket's name would imply, Geosynchronous Earth Orbit. Despite the fact that I dislike the way in which copyright strikes are dished out when showing videos of Indian launches, I still wish ISRO all the best with this latest mission. Anyway, those are all the major events that I wanted to mention for this week, which wraps up that aspect of the video there. Guys, thank you all so much for tuning in to another Space News video. I had some really great feedback from you all about the new format that I trialled last week, and while I do share the sadness with many people about the absence of the history segment, don't forget that we still have an entire year's worth of Space This Week behind us, so I've already talked about every anniversary of significance that could happen over a given year, and you can find a link to the full Space This Week playlist in the description if you want to browse to a given week. I must now give a huge thanks to all my Patreon supporters, their names are now scrolling to the left of your screens, and if you want to join that list you can sign up by following the in description or on screen link, and if you'd like to get these videos 12 hours early then why not consider joining my channel via the join button below the video, and at the same time earn yourself a cool badge next to your name and some exclusive emojis to use in the comments. There's also some video recommendations on screen, hopefully they're to your liking, thank you so much again for watching, and I'll see you on Saturday for another Kerbal video.